What next? We are going to hear a short lecture about media literacy policies in Europe, and it's given by David Buckingham. David Buckingham is a scholar and writer and a consultant specialized in young people, media, and education, and he has a great deal of expertise here. He has directed more than 25 externally funded research projects on these issues. He's been a consult for bodies such as UNESCO, United Nations, European Commission, OFCOM, and UK government. And currently he's an emeritus professor at Longborough University and a visiting professor at King's College London. And right after the keynote, we will hear a commentary by Paivi Rossi. And Paivi is an associate professor of education at the University of Lapland, Finland. And she's also a chairperson for the NGO Finnish Society on Media Education. Please. you can hear me. Um, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much to uh, Calvi for the invitation. Thank you for arranging the weather. It's very good. And thank you also for having the conference in this building. I think if you haven't looked around this building, it's fantastic. It's really worth a look upstairs. Um, I'm going to talk about um, media literacy policy um, in, in Europe. Um, it's actually very strange in the current context we're in the UK to come and talk at a European policy conference. Um, this may actually be the last time I will ever be able to talk about Europeans in the first person, or we Europeans. Um, all I can say is I am ashamed and I am embarrassed by what is happening in our country, and I hope it doesn't happen to it's also, I think, a bit ironic to come to Finland. Um, we have a long history in the UK of media literacy education, um, but the same is true in Finland. And actually, right now, things seem to be going better in Finland than they are for us in the UK. Um, I once worked with a, an American uh, media educator doing workshops with students, and he said, well, uh, we'll all come together and we'll, we'll have warm feedback and then we'll have cool feedback. Um, it, that may be better to do it that way around, but actually I'm going to reverse it. I'm going to start by giving you some cool feedback, by which I mean I'm going to start with some criticisms, some perhaps provocative statements about where I think policy is limited, is falling down, but then I want to finish by talking a bit about what I see as some positive ways forward. So, let's hope this works. Oh, yes. Um, in a way, I think that the first bit of this... <laughs> okay. Um, so I, I think we're in a situation now where there is a widespread agreement about the importance of the necessity of media literacy. So this film showed a bit of that. Um, personally, I've been making this argument for, for 40 years, and thankfully I don't have to make it again. Um, it's not just educators, it's policymakers who are, I think, realizing at last, at long last, um, that perhaps media literacy is a fundamental element, a kind of prerequisite for the modern democracy. However, I think progress in terms of policy has been slow. Um, we can all have grand intentions, but the actual implementation of policy seems to be taking a very long time. I think there is a danger that media literacy becomes a kind of a shibboleth, uh, a, a kind of icon to which we all pay lip service. We all agree that media literacy is terribly, terribly important, and actually it's something that other people can get on with. I think this is perhaps especially the case as commercial companies in the world. So we now have 
big media companies, Google, Facebook, saying, yes, we agree with this. We agree that media literacy is very important. I'll say a little bit more about that later. I want to say that I think education is key to media literacy. Media literacy without media education can easily become this kind of empty gesture. I don't think media literacy is going to happen spontaneously. It won't happen simply as a result of using media. It requires a systematic process of teaching and learning. Now, I'm aware that many groups need media literacy. It's not just children in schools. Indeed, it may well be the case that older adults need it more. Some of the research about disinformation um, that's coming out now would suggest as much. So we could argue, and I'm sure maybe we'll, we'll reinforce this, that media literacy is a process of lifelong learning, not least because the media themselves are constantly evolving. But I think either way, media literacy is an educational issue. It's a matter of public knowledge, public understanding. It's a matter of pedagogy. And if media literacy is not embedded in structures and institutions, if it's something just that we all pay lip service to or we all have warm feelings about, then really it's not going to get very far. Now, if we look in, in Europe across the last 15 years or so, there has been um, quite a history of concern about media literacy. I think there's actually a pretty history, really, in the 1990s, but by the time we get to the mid 2000s, you can see discussion of media literacy beginning to gather momentum. Initially, it's to do with internet safety, um, but then it becomes something broader than that. So from about uh, the mid to late 2000s, you can see a succession of communications, recommendations, directives, uh, declarations coming out of uh, Brussels and the European Commission. My sense is that a lot of that activity took place in the late 2000s. Um, and it slowed down. The, the, um, the latest iteration of the, the Visual Media Services Directive that Mr. Bukowskis talked about has re emphasized the importance of media literacy, perhaps pushed it a little bit further back up the agenda. So we're now moving to a situation where member states are required to promote measures for the development of media literacy skills and to report to the Commission about that. As interestingly, our video share platform YouTube of this world. Um, what's gone on across this period has been a range of state the art surveys, we've seen reviews, we've seen a series of I think quite limited uh, pilot studies, pilot projects limited, I think, by funding considerations. But nevertheless, I think there has been some good work. I mean, a couple of examples that I've, I've looked at recently of what I think are, are good, innovative projects. Firstly, the, the media coaching movement, which is happening in the Netherlands and, and Belgium, and possibly other places as well. This is media literacy, really not so much within schools, but in the context of youth work and, and libraries. It's really a really practical initiative, something that's very scalable. You know, it can be extended um, quite easily. Um, it doesn't require massive system change. It, a lot of the emphasis has been on training of practitioners. Um, another example, different kind of example, um, also supported by um, the European Commission on the Horizon 2020 um, initiative, would be the transliter transliteracies project uh, coming out of uh, Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, but with many um, European and actually wider international partners. Um, it's really interesting research, very elaborate kind of frameworks, but also, I think, importantly, practical outcomes for teachers. They have a lot of material that they produce that teachers can think easily and instantly use. So there is good stuff. There is also good stuff on a global level. So we've seen UNESCO, well, UNESCO has been talking about media education for something like 40 years. Um, 
about 10 years or so ago, it rebranded media education as media and information literacy, MIL. Um, and again, we've seen a series of declarations, conferences, um, surveys, uh, but I think importantly, we've also seen teacher education material. So if you look at that range of activity, you might think um, things are going pretty well. I think there are some problems. I think in the last 10 years or so, a lot of this activity seems to have slowed. Um, I think there is quite a lot of talk, but rather less action. And I am personally less convinced that the talk is actually going anyway. Um, some of the problems. I think there's firstly what, what I would call solutionism. Um, you know, this sense that media literacy is going to be the solution to just about any problem that you care to know. Oh, here's fake news. Well, media literacy can solve that problem. Here's internet addiction. Oh, media literacy can solve that problem. Um, so there's an idea that somehow media literacy will be this magic ingredient that will solve anybody's problem. I'll say that. More about that. I think what this leads to is a lack of coherence. So we had one kind of thing happening over here around this information, something else happening around uh, online radicalization over here, something else happening here about uh, uh, you know, selling of, of data privacy. Um, and these things are not really being effectively joined up into a coherent framework. I think there's also a sense that in media literacy, people seem to keep reinventing the wheel. There are far too many uh, media literacy frameworks out there, all doing pretty much the same kind of thing. We've seen a lot of short-term pilot projects, but very little um, sustained work going on. And perhaps, hopefully, that's something that would be more of an imperative. There are too many dead websites and unused toolkits that have been often quite well funded with European money that are just not being used. Too many state-of-the-art surveys and too little in the way of in-depth critical evaluation going on. And I think there's a lot of confusion about what are we talking about here. Particularly, I think, the confusion between media literacy and digital literacy. I'm going to say a little bit more about that in a second. So I think we've seen progress, but there are also some problems here. Now, if I was Nigel Farage, um, which thankfully I am not, um, I, you know, I could say, well, this is all because of Brussels bureaucracy. Um, and I mean, to some extent, yes, I think there has been too much of a focus on superficial, uh, short-term appearances an attempt to kind of look as though a lot is happening, when actually really that is much more um, I think there is too much of an emphasis on instant delivery. You know, we need a website, we need a toolkit, and we need it within one year, uh, otherwise you're not justified for spending the money. I think also I perceive at a European level a kind of dangerous obsession with measurements. Um, Lots of talk about levels of media literacy. Um, how do we measure people's proficiency in media literacy? Now, I think that's understandable in a way. It reflects um, an emphasis on accountability. But I think there are big questions about what is being measured, um, how is it being measured, uh, why, for whom, and what are you going to do with the measurements uh, once you have them? You know, if we find that the level of media literacy Finland is 8.3, but in Romania it's only 5.8, or it's 3.2 in Spain, or probably zero in uh, or minus zero, especially if you look at the newspapers. Um, you know, what, what does that mean? What do those kind of measurements actually mean? I'm not sure really about the purpose of this kind of measurement, um, and particularly of the international comparison. You know, how is this actually going to improve? what we do. There is always the danger of measuring what can easily be measured. Um, and what we do when we do that is we measure functional skills. We measure levels of technology. It's, we're not really measuring critical things, which I think probably is key to media literacy. 
And then there are further problems, which are, are partly about the structure of the Commission. Um, I think one of the big problems over the last 10, 15 years at the European level is to do with where media literacy has been located. It's shifted around between uh, DG education and culture and Connect, which is, is responsible for technology. It seems as though we now have media literacy in one place, we have actually media education somewhere else. We have film in one place, we have digital in another place. Television seems to have somehow fallen down between the cracks. Uh, we have cultural -ish issues over here, we have citizenship over here, we have internet safety over here. So there is a problem in terms of the structure of the commission, in terms of where media literacy and particularly a coherent policy for media literacy might be, be developed. A more fundamental problem is that the commission has very limited power with respect to education. If you feel like I do, that media literacy is an educational issue, the European Commission has very little ability to influence education policy. Education policy is a responsibility for member states. So there's a limit to how far the Commission can actually enforce uh, an educational I think actually those problems are also reflected in other supranational problems. I could make similar kind of arguments about UNESCO. UNESCO, it seems to me, has reinvented the wheel of media literacy too many times to mention. Um, and maybe actually looking to international bodies like this is to be looking to the wrong place. Perhaps if we want to influence policy, we need to start with the other direction and work from the bottom up. So my question, you know, if there are these problems, why is media literacy making such slow progress? If it's as important as we agree with it, why do we seem to be not getting anywhere or getting places but very slowly? I think there are several answers to that. Firstly, there is the point I, I made earlier about a confusion. Now, I don't want to get into a pointless debate about definition at this point, um, but I think there is a fundamental confusion about this term literacy, and I think there is a confusion particularly between media literacy and digital literacy. Media literacy, it seems to me, needs to apply to all media, old media and new media, digital media and non-digital media. Obviously, media education needs to take account of digital but digital media are not the whole story. Um, and in fact, I think we've learned a lot of history of pre-digital approaches. I think there is... I think there's also a problem here, um, a confusion between teaching through media and teaching about media. Um, so the media literacy is not about education. Media. It's not about using media as an audiovisual aid in classroom. It's not about using media as an educational delivery system, a tool. It's not even about using media as a, as a way of motivating kids or perhaps reluctance to learn. Media education is something much broader than that and it entails asking critical questions There's also this word information. As in media and information literacy. I think information is actually quite a problematic concept anyway. But what I would say in this context is it's important to remember the importance of fiction and pleasure and emotion in our engagements with media. But really, we need to be thinking about media not simply as a source of information, but as a, as a, a form and a vehicle for popular culture. Digital literacy is often, I think, seen in very limited terms. It's often seen to be a matter of functional competence, uh, an instrumental matter. It's about skills in information retrieval. It's about learning to code uh, computer programming. Uh, media literacy, as I might want to define it, is about critical thinking. It's not just about being an efficient user or consumer. 
of technology. So I think we could do well to be a lot clearer about what it is we're talking about when we talk about media literacy rather than they may slide around. I think a second problem, um, and I've alluded to it already, is this problem of solutionism. Um, you know, you might well ask, well, why are we even talking about media literacy in, in the first place? What do we want media literacy to do? And I think one of the big difficulties has been that media literacy in a way offers an answer to everybody. It's something for everybody. Um, so at the moment, you know, the argument is media literacy will help us solve the problem of fake news disinformation. Media literacy will address hate speech, radicalization internet addiction. If you look back longer, we have a view of media literacy as being about operating technology, the appreciating cultural heritage, protecting children, uh, you know, promoting stronger public media, uh, about training workers, uh, media literacy is about human rights, media literacy is about world peace. I mean, I, I kid you not. Um, so, you know, all these arguments have been made for media literacy. Media literacy seems to be the answer to everybody's problem. Um, and in the process, then, well, you know, what does it entail that media literacy is about competency, it's about uh, cultural appreciation, it's about old media and new media, it's about young people and old people, it's about teachers, parents, media workers, it happens in many different settings, and so on and so on. I can find you examples from the literature of people making all of these arguments and then talking. Um, and I think you know this raises some big questions about what are we what are we talking about here and why are we talking about it? I think the danger is we have this kind of solutionism. Um, you know the idea that we have a problem and what media literacy will do will be to offer us a simple solution. I think we've seen that very much with the debate over the last couple of years about Facebook. And, and disinformation. Um, so media literacy becomes the answer to the problem of fake news. Um, and the danger, I think, of that is that it assumes that these problems are actually going to easily solved and they'll all go away. I want to say, when it comes to disinformation, when it comes to fake news, actually these are much bigger issues. They have much more complex um, and difficult causes. And imagine fantasizing that media literacy will be the answer, I'm afraid, is, is a bit of wishful thinking. I think in all of this, one of the tendencies that is very apparent is the idea that media literacy is a kind of substitute for media regulation. Media literacy in the UK arrived on the scene at a point where the media system was being deregulated. We were moving towards a much more free market system in media. Um, and in some ways, you could argue that what happened with media literacy was a similar kind of movement that happened in many other areas of social and public policy. That responsibility for regulation was being taken away from the state, was being passed over to what was seen to be informed consumers. So this new free market system was creating all sorts of problems, the risks, the dangers, but what we needed to do was to arm the individual, arm the consumer to make their own informed choices about media. I think that movement, that responsibilizing of the individual, is something that's very apparent in a whole range of areas of social policy. Now we can see that in the UK and there's a story I can tell about how media literacy, even though we've had media education for many, many years, um, media literacy came onto the agenda, particularly following uh, a new Communications Act 2003. We had a new media regulator, Ofcom, who was uh, given responsibility to promote media literacy. Um, interesting contrast, actually, with the film that I've been learning this morning is that one of the big problems, one of the big problems, was that um, Ofcom was is the media regulator and responsibility for media was given to the media regulators, not to the department. The is related to, in complex ways, the Department of Education and Culture. 
And that is a very different situation. And, and the UK, what happened was that basically the Ministry of Education backed off. It didn't really want to get involved in a discussion about media literacy. And so media literacy then is very much like as an alternative to regulation. And what happened then was that increasingly it became a solution to much smaller but more easily resolvable problems. So media literacy was effectively reduced from a broader um, educational project about critical thinking to internet safety and what the head of the media literacy of Ofcom once called getting grannies online. So getting sexist as well as ageist. Um, you know, getting elderly people online. So media literacy becomes, um, in fact, effectively replaced by uh, what they tend to call digital participation. Um, there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of story um, around all of this and, and what went on and why it happened. Um, but I think the key thing was that media literacy very much became um, something to which everybody would pay lip service. Yes, yes, media literacy is terribly important. We care deeply about media literacy. But actually, when it came to doing it, particularly when it came to doing it at the level of education policy and education practice, it really wasn't happening. And in fact, in many ways, we were moving backwards. And that leaves me asking well, you know, governments may say they want critical media literacy, but how far do they actually really want it? Okay. My time is running out. So uh, I hope you can, this is going to be about three hours. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm doing great. Um, I, so this leads on to, to one key question, I think. You know, where is education in all of this? I think seeing media literacy as a responsibility for regulators and not for educators results in a very limited form of, of media literacy. And I think that is apparent at the European level as well. The Audiovisual Media Services Director places responsibility. Education on media regulator, I'm um, sorry, on, on the industry, on media regulator, but not particularly on educators, because it doesn't have the ability to actually intervene in, in education policy. Um, and I find this increasingly. I go to, or I hear about high level expert conferences on disinformation and media literacy. And of course, yes, Google and Facebook are there, you know, the policy makers from government are there, the media regulators are there. But where are the educators? Maybe one or two academics, but where are the teachers? Where are the youth workers? Where are the librarians? Where are those professionals represented in the discussion? And they're not there. Um, and this happens in, in the UK as well. What you had is a conference with lots of well-meaning millennials so, well-meaning millennials with, with important sounding job titles working for corporates or NGO organizations, uh, but actually not really very much actual experience. And meanwhile, no practitioners on, on the ground. Um, so a, a, a problem, and I think there is a particular problem that we really need to address about the role of commercial companies in all of this. I mean, the story here is essentially that Google and Facebook, big technology companies, have been getting deservedly a bad press about fake news, but also about the wider of privacy. Um, it seems to have taken something for a very long time to realize how these companies make so much money. I mean, it was pretty obvious, really. Um, but what media literacy does is, is that it offers them a very neat, easy solution to their problem. Well, we can't regulate them. We don't want to regulate them because actually that will undermine our, our profits and our whole business model. So what we'll do is we'll pass responsibility for regulation to the individual consumer. The consumer will have to look after themselves. So if you look globally, the best funded media literacy initiatives around the world are actually not the SEO or the European Commission. They're Google and Facebook. Um, now, I'm perhaps inclined to be a bit too cynical about this, but, you know, I wonder how much of this is any more than literacy, any more than a sort of attempt at corporate social responsibility. 
a form of public relations for companies that are deservedly having some different questions to answer. One of the other aspects of this, which I think is, is very interesting, so yes, it may be PR for technology jobs, but for old media companies, media literacy can also be quite useful. What we have is, certainly in the UK, BBC, um, newspapers, um, putting more money and more of their energy into promoting media literacy initiatives in schools. Um, and I think this is part of the move that they want to make, which is to say that, well, fake news, disinformation, this is not our problem. This is not our responsibility. It's Facebook's problem. We, the old media companies, and we're all terribly responsible. We produce quality journalism. Um, and what they're doing, in a sense, is offering another form of public relations. So there is a bit of a risk in all of this that what these old media companies are doing is, in a sense, getting themselves off the hook of some of the critical questions we might want to ask about the bias for some of them. Almost at the end. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think there is also a bigger problem because I think alongside the push to media literacy, what we've seen, certainly in the UK, but I think actually in the fashion, is education systems moving backwards. Education systems in many countries moving back to a 19th century curriculum, moving back to old-fashioned teaching methods. Uh, we have this new emphasis on knowledge, on prescribed knowledge and facts, on cultural heritage. We're seeing a backlash against student-centered teaching methods. We're seeing a fetishization of STEM, science and technology subjects, Certainly in the UK, a really significant marginalisation of arts, humanities, social sciences, and media literacy um, is, is part of that. It's a, 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 and also a kind of instrumentalising of literacy. Literacy becomes a set of decontextual skills. We're not talking about literacy as being about critical thinking or, or cultural understanding. Literacy comes to be seen as something that's about a set of decontextual instrumental skills. Now, that takes a particular form in, in Britain at the moment, but I think this is an international movement. Uh, what the Finnish educator Palsy Salberg calls the GERM, the Global Education Reform Movement. Um, and what he means is this move backwards in terms of thinking about education where it's going. And the problem is that media literacy goes against the brain of all of this. Okay, I'm aware that I probably only have one more minute, so I will, I, I'm going to skip a little bit, and I'm going to go, I'm, okay, well I'm going to go to my last slide, and I'll, I'll <laughs> I'm going to go to my last slide. Um, because, I, you know, I've been presenting you with a rather sad and sorry story. <laughs> about why we're not going anywhere. Um, and what I want to do just to finish is to give you a sense of what I think it is that we, we need. Um, and I think the answer to this is has got to be multifaceted. Uh, this is not a simple matter to get any good happening. Yes, we need policy documents. And yes, those policy documents need to focus on education, not just media regulation. But policy documents with all the fine words in the world are not going to make things happen. What we need is real commitment that is about having a plan for implementation, for being really clear about who is going to be responsible for this, about where it's going to happen. And I mean what I said, that really media literacy is not embedded in structures and institutions, then it's not going to happen. Um, what support do the people, the, the teachers, the professional practitioners in this context, what support do they need? We need some clear answers to those questions, and not just um, hot air um, policy documents. We need, yes, obviously, curriculum models. We need curriculum models that are coherent, that are memorable, 
that are not too complicated. Um, what I find is that academics in particular are very keen on generating elaborate conceptual models with all sorts of overlapping circles, arrows pointing in all directions. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that teachers, people you know, working on the ground, find almost entirely useful. Um, so I, I, I think we have actually curriculum models. I, I don't think we need to be more of those. We need, obviously, teaching and learning resources. And again, I would say, I don't think we need any more textbooks or toolkits that will you know, instantly solve the problem of, of playing the news. What we need is resources for teaching and learning that have really developed through a long-term process of research, of testing things out in the classroom, where teachers um, and other professionals are fundamentally involved in the process of development. What we don't want is whoever it is, government, NGOs, Google, Facebook, delivering things to teachers that teachers are then expecting to, to implement. What we need is something that comes much more um, from the grassroots. We need in-depth, sustained training for teachers and for other practitioners. This is not, you are not going to learn to do media literacy education in an afternoon here and there. You're not going to learn it from a TED talk. Teaching in this area is complicated. There's a lot that you need to know, but pedagogy is is difficult. What we need is long-term, in-depth um, education of the profession. And that's something I think that needs to happen at an informal level as well as formal level. It's not just about university courses, it's also about networks of professionals, it's about people sharing good practice, it's about professional development led within professional communities. Um, and I think if the European Commission, for example, wants to support a European media legislative community, it needs to be supporting teachers, librarians, youth workers, professionals directly, for example, through teaching exchanges, through study visits, and so on. We need um, professional development to be happening, not just from the top down, but also um, from the bottom up. We need research and we need evaluation. Lots and lots of grand claims are made about media literacy and media literacy education. Uh, not all of it is good, um, and we need to take a cool and calm look at what is actually happening um, and how good it is. We need to make a clear distinction, I think, which is not always made, between self-justification and proper evaluation. We need independent evaluation. Um, I think we need, in particular, research that looks really closely at the actual learning process. Most research on media literacy doesn't really look at the detail of what actually goes on. It looks at the outcomes, which are often measured in quite limited terms, but it doesn't look at the learning process. And the learning process might be difficult and, and complicated. I think we also, um, as I've said, need to make research and do practice accessible. Um, and I probably don't need so many expert groups and conferences because very little of that discussion actually finds its way to the practitioners who are doing this. Teachers need to be involved as researchers in their own rights, documenting, evaluating their own practice. I think that's a key element of seeing educators as professionals. And yes, we're going to pull the bottom. Oh no, we need, and we need partnerships as well. But here again, I think we need people, partnerships, and we need genuine dialogue. I think we need to be aware of partnerships that actually exclude the people on the front line. Yes, we need media companies, policy makers, NGOs, civil society organizations. But we need to find ways of ensuring that it's not those people who are dominating the debate, but we're listening to other voices. Okay, well, it's still five minutes too long, I'm very sorry. Um, I blog about this and write about this, so if you're interested, please uh, visit my blog for digestible versions.